my name is Jack Rook, and welcome to the 2017 Roundhouse Poetry Slam! Yes! It's so lovely to be here. It's so lovely to be here. Uh, I am an ex-participant myself. I'm an ex-poet in the slam. I did the 2012 slam that wasn't in the main space, it was in the Sackler space. This has grown so much over the years. We're now in our ninth year, and I'm just going to make a confession right now. When I did it, I got disqualified. Thank you! Thank you very much. Thank you. Not because I cheated, but because I read from the page and I forgot that in the rule book you were supposed to memorize it. Uh, I can't even remember my own pin. It's gone contactless. It's great. Um, I'm really chuffed to be here. We've got some incredible poets who are going to be performing for you tonight. There's already been two heats. So we've had 46 poets so far who've gone through the heats. They've competed from the UK and beyond. It's international now, guys. Uh, and tonight we've got 11 poets. They're all behind me, aged 11 to 25. Give them a round of applause. And they will be competing for the title of the Roundhouse Poetry Slam, uh, for, for the sort of title of champion. Uh, and now, I'm going to explain the rules. There's three rules. One of them, which isn't a rule anymore, is that you can read from the page, which for my year would have been helpful. Um, but you can do that. So, the three main rules. Each poem has to be three minutes long maximum. I don't really believe in like coming on at like two minutes 57 and like sort of swandering on, so I won't do that. But guys, if we make a joint agreement, are we all cool with that? Perfect, because it saves me coming across as the villain. Also, no excessive swearing. Uh, is a sort of another rule that we're going to stick to. This event is being live streamed, live broadcast on Facebook. I don't know where the camera is. I'm going to wave. Where's the camera? Can someone shout? Is it literally just like here? Oh, it's here! Hiya! How you doing? Press like on Facebook now and do that weird thing where all the thumbs come up, like in the Clinton-Trump debates. Uh, but let's pretend we're Clinton before we all know what happened. Okay, so, uh, and then finally, they will be judged on both writing and performance. So, bringing on to that section, I really think we should be talking to our three judges. Now, we're really chuffed tonight. We have got three judges that represent lots of different things to this slam, lots of different things to spoken word and poetry and writing and beyond that. So our first judge that we're going to talk to is the brilliant Caleb Femi. Hello, Caleb. So Caleb won the slam in 2015, and he is also the Young Person's Poets Laureate for London. We have got an absolute expert in the building. Uh, Caleb, are you okay? I feel like the judges are more nervous than the poets, which is quite cool. Um, Caleb, I was wondering, you were in this position two years ago. What advice would you give to our 11 poets? Be yourself. Pretty good. Pretty good. Be yourself. I mean, it's a very good bit of advice, really. I think it's probably the one that I'd give to you guys. Be yourself and read from the page if you want. I'm not bitter. Perfect. Uh, and then we have our, our next judge, who is an amazing poet. She's come through the Roundhouse scheme, the creative projects. She did the slam nine years ago. Am I right? Uh, she's a writer and a journalist and an amazing person. Can you give it up for the wonderful Bridget Menemore? Bridget, what advice are you going to give to the crew? You know, um, have fun, enjoy it, breath control, just like make sure that you are breathing and not rushing through. That's what Beyonce says to Michelle every time. <laughs> um, and we're going to go, <laughs> I'm doing a thing later about Beyonce and Michelle, but I'll come back to it, spoiler. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much, Bridget. Important thing, be yourself, be confident. And last but not least, we have a, a, a poet and a writer, an author, somebody who's written some really acclaimed piece of performance, and her show is on tomorrow night in this space with a little bit of luck. Can we please give it up for the brilliant Sabrina Mafuz? <laughs> Hi, Sabrina. Uh, I feel like I'm sort of like gradually edging around. Um, I'm going to ask you, what are you looking for? What do you think tonight? We're looking at both writing and performance. What, uh, what will sort of make you impressed? Um, well, as you said, we're sitting around in a little corner here. Yeah. 
<laughs> in the shadows. So um, I suppose for me, it's going to be a performance and a poem that reaches around the corner and arrests me anyway, even though I can't see. Yeah. Very good. Give it up for Sabrina and for the rest of our judges. Thank you very much. Perfect. So everyone's introduced. There's one more person that I want to introduce tonight. Uh, we are the new Ant and Deck. My name is Jack, and please, can we have a massive round of applause for the wonderful Jackie? So, Jackie Beckford is going to be here. She's been doing British Sign Interpretation. We really want, especially with events at the Roundhouse, for them to be accessible to as many people as possible. This is a brilliant way of doing it. I've been saying, I've sort of been abusing my power as host and backstage been saying some words that I was just very intrigued as to what they would convert to in sign language. And you might see a couple of them tonight. So, we are going to kick off uh, without much further ado. Uh, is there anything else that I need to say? Oh yeah, we're all here for one reason. There's going to be a winner and there's prizes. So, the two runners up will receive a prize of £100 and £200 and two trophies, and then the winner will receive a £500 prize, yes, and a trophy. And also, basically, what kind of happens is that these poets will then continue to be mentored and developed under the Roundhouse Creative Project Scheme, which is something that hopefully the majority of you guys in this room are either benefiting from or contributing towards. And um, we really hope you enjoyed tonight. And remember, guys, we're all here to have fun. There's an even bigger competition going on somewhere else in this country. Um, but this is the important one tonight. So, yes, give them all a round of applause. Um, I think when I did this back in 2012, I was so nervous. There's like nothing like sort of standing on stage. Some people, they're not, you know, seasoned performers. This could be one of their first times performing and they've made it all the way to the final on their merit and skill and talent alone. So it really is up to you guys to be as supportive and generous as possible. You look lovely. It's also it's quite scary speaking in the main space at the Roundhouse. Um, so if you guys can be as kind as possible, what I want to do, I just want to do like a sort of test, like your sound check. We've all sound checked. Now it's your turn. I'm going to start over here. What is your name, my love? You. Yep, you. Louisa. Okay, Louisa, you're going to be the whole of the Roundhouse's hype girl. Are you happy with that? Brilliant. Perfect. Okay. What we're going to do, over here, we're going to start off with a clap. And I'm talking like a sort of Radio 4 Poetry Hour clap. It's all like, oh, that was impressive. I don't like that. Lovely. Can you start a little clap for me, please, Louisa? Is this going to start? Yeah, nice. But then we're going to have a flitter. Very polite. Like somebody had done well at Wimbledon. And then over here, you're going to be Radio 2. You're going to be like knee slapping, Paul Simon on. You guys, Radio 1, Teenage Girls, Screams and Hollers. You lot, Pirate Radio, lose your shit! And stop! Oh my gosh. Well done, everybody. Perfect. Uh, that is the most efficient audience applause I've seen. So what I want to do is I want to get that to spread. I'm going to bring on our first poet of the slam. Um, and yeah, if everyone could just keep up with that excitement and energy, and we're going to have a lovely Roundhouse Poetry Slam final! Yes! So, the first poet I'm going to bring onto the stage, can we have a warm welcome for the brilliant Jasmine Gardosi! Good luck! In through your nose, out through your mouth. In for five, out for five. That is breathing. It sends oxygen through your bloodstream and into your cells. So it's pretty good for you. I recommend it. I'm telling you now, because you're going to find it hard. You're going to find it hard as you balance at the dining table and pretend you cannot taste the toxins that balloon through the room. See, your family friends will be joking about that presenter on TV. 
She's one of those, isn't she? Lesbian? She just needs to find the right man. No one knows you're gay yet. Not even you, really. But still, these speech bubbles will expand as clouds that become a part of the atmosphere. Bunch of queers. Homo! Pufta! Bumboy! What they speak, you absorb. And your brother's car will be fueled by it. And the science corridor will swirl in it. And this isn't your kind of oxygen. Maybe you belong to an alien race. That would explain why you're that unidentified crying object in the school toilet. But I'm telling you now, you've got to keep breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. In for five, out for five. Big fat dyke, punch as hell. What they speak, you absorb. Fugger, lesbo, inhale, exhale, inspire, expire. But no one aspires to being the butt of the joke. So you will try to press your lips tight and hold your lungs the entire time until you escape that enormous chamber that you call your teenage years. But trust me, that's quite a long time to wait. You might find it tempting to stop altogether. All I can ask for you to do is to try adding your bit of air to the climate. There might be someone else out there who needs it. What will they absorb once you speak it? Give it up for the brilliant Jasmine Gargosi. And now welcome to the stage, Tambe Mapula. At first glance, perhaps you allowed the forces of nature to persuade you into thinking you stand a chance. Gazed an opportunity to charm your way into my pants and claim my heart as yours. Perhaps you saw a challenge or maybe I'm not the prize you had your eyes on, but I will not apologize for being bold and strong and passionate and bright and wrong. I display nothing delicate outwardly. And even though my inner battles are fought quietly, the words I let drip from my mouth and evaporate into your ears undress, the more I speak to you, conveying nothing but naked truth. I won't attempt to lure you with my looks. I won't gimmick you with flirtatious gestures or charm you with superfluous words and I expect the same in return. For over time, I have come to learn that first impressions are as finite as love at first sight. The things which live on are the mountains yet to be moved. So show me your ugly, your sentimental, your messy, your blunt, your just plain silly. Show me your weak. You're indecisive, you're cheek, you're human. Because that's all there is to me. And these bones which frame my flaws, holding up these walls I keep to hide a heart which somehow always, always seems to find its way to my sleeves. Its strings are still being retuned by the chief musician, so if you dare, To listen to this bird's song, be sure to listen to it well, for she doesn't sing it for just anyone. Give it up for Tambe Mavula. And now welcome to the stage, Ify Grill. My body was made of choruses, bound together in symphony, blood flowing through my veins in unapologetic rejoicement. I learned to dance before I could walk. And for people like me, like my ancestors, dance has always been our saving grace. And from young, 
We're taught to stomp, stomp, clap the beat to victory, milly our way out of oppression and jump high, so we never felt low. When I dance, I feel free, like a bird who can fly away from danger or like a lion who can face it head on. When I dance, I say to the world that caged birds, they don't just sing, they got funky feet too. When I dance, I feel powerful and vulnerable at the same time. When I dance, it's like I'm connecting with God. And while you all can't hear the music, my soul hears it clearly because it sounds like prayer, like Sunday service, like my great-great-grandmother coming back from the grave to give me a high five, which is to say, I don't dance alone. Black ghosts dance with me. Sometimes I just dance to forget as if moving these hips will help me erase the image of all the black men who can't move theirs. If I dance long enough, maybe I'll forget to cry, because you know, these hips, they hold secrets. They tell tales. They tell of the truth passed down generation. They tell tales of underground railroads, of waves in the water, of pain, of love, of joy, of genocide, of truth. And ain't that beautiful? Ain't that a secret worth sharing? And maybe that's why my black don't crack, because you know, during the worst of times when the world tries to destroy you, we'll find rhythm in each other, even as we lose ourselves. Maybe that's why when my ancestors were hung on trees, they still swayed in the wind. Because black bodies dance longer than they live. They move longer than they breathe. Because despite blood and tears, they dance. Why do you think they call it dancing in the rain? Because for you, dance is movement. It's fun. It's your EDM and your cocktails. It's saying, we can't stop on a Saturday night, but you always go back to Malibu on a Sunday. But for us, dance is our glory. It's our battle cry. It's never apologizing for who you are. It's finding home in a beat, comfort in a pop, security in a nene, it's resilience. It's being carefree in a war zone. It's finding beauty in an ugly humanity. It's knowing during the worst of times when the world tried to strip this black boy joy from my dying body, I'm never unarmed because dance is my weapon. It's my uncompromising glory. So come on world, step onto the dance floor. Show me what you got. Use your S Club 7 dance moves and try Keep up. <laughs> Give it up for Izzy Grillo. And now, welcome to the stage, Enyi Okoronko. Of all the murky memories that I can't make out fully, I thought I owed you, so here's an ode to a bully. Friends first, if you can cast your mind back but that got sidetracked by secondary school because all of a sudden I wasn't cool. But it wasn't as sudden as you would have thought. See, I was the guy who at the mere mention of Dragon Ball Z would get animated. At break time, I played chess and yes, all my Pokemon shinies were laminated. I'd say at best, my swag was understated. But somehow since summer, you had got cooler Somehow you grown a foot taller, hair cut like a footballer, and you had the boots to match. I wore my dad's old ones with the soles all cracked and the insoles slipping through. So you did what you had to do and added depth to the distance that had grown between us. See, if I had known they'd seen us, I wouldn't have asked where you wanted to sit in science. My back was too brittle for the breath that broke the silence, let alone the violence that left me with my jaw out of joint. A point well made, a price well paid, and the current currency was all the friends I'd ever had, one. Now, none. And there wasn't room for many more living life under your thumb. See, a wrong look was a right hook. If I had it, then you took, and your penchant for pulling pages ruined many a good book. Looking for reason or rhyme, there was a time I stuck a compass in my wrist and I found a fair few. Funnily enough, one of them was you. See, you would try to ruin this memory of friendship I had, but you could never really spoil it. I think it's because 
I always knew deep down you were the same kid that got kicks pissing his skid marks off the toilet. If you can cast your mind back. Thank you. Give it up for Andy Okoronko. And now welcome to the stage, Layla Josephine. I would like to discuss travel pillows. Yes, travel pillows. The ones that wrap around your neck like life jackets. God knows why these people consider to pack it. Yes, I'm talking about travel neck supports. The inflatable, debatable rubber ring of plastic crap. People seem to think that they're buying some extra comfort. Comfortable. Do I look comfortable to you right now? Lightweight travel support that only supports your ears makes you look like you've been in a car crash, a neck brace you've been wearing for far too many years. I think it's time we come together to unite because deep down we know that travel pillows are shite and pointless. They are pointless on the plane, then you get those people taking them everywhere with, looking like Bo Select on WH Smith. Now, I must take this opportunity to apologize for something that happened on a specific flight, but I was driven to it. I'd finally seen the light after a delayed check-in and a bag being overcharged, being pushed around at boarding, candy crush echoing through departure lounges, travel pillows everywhere. I was completely surrounded. It was enough to send anyone crazy. I entered the aircraft and I squeezed and bundled down the aisle only to find my flight partner was a travel pillow kind of guy. And he was in my seat. I looked at my ticket, yes, 8A, my window seat, and there he was, reading from a Kindle, treating me like a mug briefcase under the seat in front, so smug with polished black shoes. I paid an extra 250 to see those views. Excuse me, sir, but you're actually in my seat. He looked at me. Well, he tried to. Have you ever seen anyone try and turn their head in a travel pillow? It looks pretty painful. He shuffled on down, shook his head inside, made me feel like I was one of the bad guys. I sat down and rested my head by the window, but just before takeoff, I had begun the meltdown. This guy who had the nerve to sit in my seat was breathing like an elephant on heat. A snotty nosed bastard child behind me was kicking and rocking my chair. A woman toe rose back was saying her prayers. And a kid in front with iPad with sound up full blast. Pilots droning on about flight arrival times and forecasting the air hostess was patronizing and had lipstick on her teeth. The plane starts to rumble from underneath and I couldn't breathe. Jammed up at the window in this floating metal can, shivering from the air con and still sitting next to this travel pillow man. <sighs> I can't breathe. The travel pillows are taking up all of the air. <laughs> I slowly and calmly took out my ear stud. By this point, my emotions were numb and I plunged it deep into my neighbor's neck, feeling the air deflate. It felt great. I unbuckled my seatbelt and stood on my chair. We were now 15,000 feet in the air and I was shouting, Monday, you bunch of travel pigeon fucks. Who wants the shot? Running down the aisle, popping those not black supports like they were bombs, breaking into staff quarters before they could catch me, covering myself in in-flight beef teriyaki, covering it all over my chest and face as the pilot calls back up at airbase. I was crunching on a Toblerone sporadically, spraying Britney Spears perfume manically. It was pure, glorious insanity, and I laughed so hard that I cried. I went to jail for the night. Ended up in court, handcuffed through Dubai Airport, but at least when I went down, it was poetic and heartfelt. I think we should take a stand against these money-grabbing pillows. Let's pop them all. We will become Ryanair heroes. And to you, pillow man, are you uncomfortable on a plane or a train? Put your head in your hand on a window or even a friend. Let's put these ineffective cushions to an end. Infiltrate and deflate these waste of space cushions that offer nothing but ear rest solutions. Thank you. Good afternoon, now welcome to the stage, Sahima Manzor Khan. The first time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, I flinch, gasp. I almost spill the milk, I tell him no. That is not a word we use to talk about ourselves. What I do not tell him, what hovers in the space between my words, is that that is only another word people use about us, a word to crush and hurt us, a word to own us, but not be owned by us. The second time my brother comes home from school and uses the word 
Paki, my mother, admonishes him, tells him how that word was used to break her bones when she was a child, tells him the neighbors would think he had no respect for himself if they heard him. What hangs in the silence is that that is because Paki deserves no respect, that to say it might remind them that our skins are not white, and to our ancestors, this was never home. My grandfather pours over a three-inch photograph on a phone screen cradled in his muscular autumnal hands. Hands that taught themselves how cotton was spun in Bradford Mills where the lack of light blurred young men's sight. Hands that held 21 grandchildren in a foreign land to give them hopes and dreams on these streets paved with gold and lined with blackened terraced housing. That's not what it looked like when I lived there. The words fall from his mouth. 42 years heavy with the weight of not forgetting home. The third time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, I ask him why he is using it pejoratively, why he is synonymizing it with filth and subpar. He tells me that is the only way he has heard it been used before. The fourth time my brother comes home from school and uses the word packy, I smile. I lead him to the kitchen, cut out our tongues, slice them up and sew them back together in new shapes, relearning the language of our grandmother. I stand him in the mirror, show him how to wipe these ivory white apologies from our skins, take him to the garden, tell him to look up high, let the sun work her art on his beautiful face. We spit out sorry and vomit attempts at assimilation all over the grass, for assimilation without acceptance is not that. The rain comes and washes the dust from our hands, a color of pain. And this is what it is to be a Paki. Give it up for Sir Haima Manzul Khan. And now welcome to the stage, Tyrone Lewis. Um, so, I don't think much would change if Luke Skywalker were black. I mean, his sister would still be a princess. Um, he'd still grow up in the ghetto of Tatooine, and his father would still abandon him at birth. He'd still learn to shoot womp rats. He'd still race in his skyhopper before he was 13, and he'd still come home one day to see the remains of his family. His blackness would just serve to make their deaths less of a surprise. Obi-Wan would be his uncle, despite not sharing blood. Yoda would be his uncle, despite not sharing blood. Han would be his brother, and he'd still join the rebellion, and his father would still beat him. In this version, Luke's triumph would come in his revenge, rather than Invader's redemption. We'd have to make Anakin black, too. His mother could say that he didn't have a father, but that doesn't have to be the whole truth. Just enough to let him think that he is the chosen one enough so that he will push himself, better himself, strive to become a better version of himself, and his mother would still be murdered. Her blackness would just serve to make her death less of a surprise. Qui-Gon would be his uncle despite not sharing blood. Mace Windu would be his uncle despite not sharing blood, and he'd still join the Sith. He'd see Palpatine as his father figure. He'd figure that's the kind of figure he'd like to be when he grows up, and he'd still murder his wife. Their blackness would just serve to make this death less of a surprise, and we wouldn't have to change much in The Force Awakens. Finn could still be black. We could make Rey black. Kylo Ren, we'd make him mixed race, but when he kills his father, the galaxy will never see him blacker. See, I really don't think much would change if Luke Skywalker were black. We could still say that these films all took place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. They'd still have that exact same opening crawl. There'd still be a shocking lack of women in all these films. Jar Jar Binks would still be a little bit racist. Lando Calrissian would be the coolest motherfucker in the planet, and James L. Jones' voice would make a lot more sense. And I'd still see myself as Luke rejecting any possible notion that I could one day become my father. Give it up for Tyrone Lewis. And now welcome to the stage, Sarah McCrady. I've been 
waiting my whole life for you. There is a baby born in 1992, and maybe there is something in the way she has passed from father to mother that says they've already decided they don't love each other anymore. There's a girl in 1999, building universes and families at skinhead Barbies, grateful for an imagination louder than her dad's wet blue eyes downstairs. There's a girl in 2006, sinking in backyard, damp grass, under fat stars, wondering what it'd be like to be adored. I had days I spent on the sofa that I thought I lost down the back of it. I hadn't. You were just around the corner. You did it first. Flushed cheeks, deep November. You held my hand and it felt like, like you know when you're born, those first few seconds before anything bad has ever happened to you. When you feel so happy, when you feel so alive, when you are so happy to be alive that you could scream and you do, it felt like that. And you know, I always forget that we aren't normal and think maybe people are staring because they've never seen two people love each other so much. They'll be walking home zip coats cold evening when they see two girls holding hands, jaws drop, disbelieve in trust me. They look so long they probably start thinking it must be love or something like it because man can't understand how something so earth turning life affirming heavenly can take place without him <laughs> a relationship between women is not taken seriously because women are not taken seriously our love protects itself and when bad dads and sad lads love and call us something i'm in no bother to change their mind Excuse me for not caring. Excuse me for not taking them aside to explain the feeling I get when I'm dozing and she holds me from behind. How every time I kiss her, it might as well be the first time. And how I wasn't sure I'd hold anyone's hand like that. Ever. I wouldn't want to yell at catcallers and melt misogynies with anybody else. <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life for you. You are the kind of wonderful that makes puppies kick out in their dreams. You're a love soup, heart frog. Got a look in your eye to make Michael Jordan sob. I had days with you that I swear I spent on heaven, but I must have spent on earth, because I ain't dead, or religious, or an astronaut. <laughs> Though, babe, when I see you, you send my heart on first class mail to Mars. Oh, my brain's on Neptune, and my limbs are on Jupiter. Your love is medicine. And I've been waiting my whole life for you. Give it up for Sarah McCraney. And now, welcome to the stage, Rachel Norcoro. For the attention, 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 attention of the gentlemen, 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 gentlemen that approached me asking, how much? Sorry that I felt the need for some clarification. But in this consumer nation, surely you would appreciate the confusion. Thing is, I was stupidly under the illusion that I resembled a human being, not a fucking Aldi. But since we're asking, I'd quite like to know, were you wanting some green or a bag of snow? Or did you think I was dealing in pirate DVDs? Because I confess my cousin still has my copy of Finding Dory. But, good sir, I still aim to please, and though I can't offer you any of these, I wonder if you could please appease me and tell me what piece of me you need. I'm curious, really, what it was about me that made you want to reduce me to a juicy piece of just-before-sell-by-date beef. How does it work? Were you looking for a hand job? A blow job because job center employed and your job center called and you're still unemployed. It's funny. I told you the thought that there was something in my look that day. It must have been something in the way that you dressed. Now that I reassess it, I did hear that duffel coats were the new aphrodisiac. Fuck! I am a sleaziac. Call me a slut. I should have known better. I could be a great trendsetter and convince myself it weren't a big deal. Do not make a mountain out of what mainstream media insists is a molehill. Ladies, don't you know that sex sells? He's merely buying. 
Are you even trying to see it from his point of view? I mean, damn, look at you. He's asked for our consent. It's got to be a compliment, right? Mm. <laughs> Except, I don't think that's quite right. You know, you know, you know I tried to fight. I slapped you on the head before you ran, you shit. And I kicked your motorbike to bits. I did fuck all damage, but I went for it. I screamed at you to dare to come back for it. <laughs> Despite all that, you still managed to make me feel sick. You still made me feel dirty in my own skin. You still managed to make me feel unsafe three minutes from my own bed. So when it's all done and said these words, don't make me sleep at night. They don't stop me from being scared of the sight of the next pizza guy on a motorbike. My friends call me a superhero, but I am not. So I'd like to hand in the quote because it doesn't make me brave that I spoke. It meant I was tired of being afraid. Uh, so, Mr. Pizza Guy, you may think I am weak, but I am still going to speak. I might not be the Hulk, but you won't make me believe that we can't be incredible. Not anymore. So, here's the final score. I wish I could eradicate you because your existence makes my brain hurt, but I do not think that would work because you're like a stray pube. When you get rid of one, five more come to the funeral, so I am just going to say it straight. <laughs> if you could stop looking for young women on their way home, it'd be really great. Because trust me, they're not looking for you. If I'm honest, I was looking for a chicken sheesh with garlic mayo and chili sauce, and I still bought it, and I ate it. And it was amazing. Bit expensive, but pretty damn tasty. And to answer your question, it was £5.50. Give it up for the brilliant Rachel Norcoro. And now, welcome to the stage, Jack Sweeney. For some reason, I'm climbing a mountain. I'm climbing a mountain, you know. Everyone was standing on trains. I'm climbing a mountain and it suddenly becomes really steep. Trains were like Thomas the Tank Engine being ridden by Power Rangers. I punched some famous person. You know I was in danger, yeah. And then we got to the top and then it turned into Curry's, the superstore. But what I heard and what I saw was flowers that talk and they're talking to me and they're like laughing at me because I've lost my parents. And I'm really sad because I'm a kid and I've lost my parents. And then strangely, Leonardo DiCaprio was there and I went out with him. <laughs> the only thing I do is just take his jacket. He was really honest and really open about it. It was like, I'm just letting you know that I'm thinking about cheating on you. I've not done it yet. <laughs> because I respect you. And suddenly it was clear to me that firstly he was the operator of everything that was going on and secondly that he was the evil force in the universe and that was very true and very real. I win a lifetime supply of feta cheese and I, I said to the guy who worked at TFL, um, dude, can you step in England or get the transport police? And, and the guy just like looked at me solemnly and shook his head and he just held out his hand and he gave me a knife, 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 knife and he gave me a knife. We were camping on the ocean. Someone fell into the water and I wanted to help. There was only the moon and no other lights. I don't know who that person is, but I helped that person out, but I couldn't get out because the water was filling up so that the upper world was going away and away more and more. And I only know that the whales were coming and they wanted to, yeah, to keep me down. So I was basically, and I didn't know what would happen if what the whales were doing with me, but I, yeah, I died in the ocean, yeah, very many times. It made me even so uh, afraid that I didn't even go to the to the rivers or lakes anymore because the whales, 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 the whales. So I was having a really stressful day at work. As usual, this woman comes up to me and she's like, just take my shoes. Devil wears Prada and she bit me. But the most biggest pressing issue for some reason, I'm climbing a mountain. I'm climbing a mountain, you know. I'm climbing a mountain and it suddenly becomes really steep. 
Just before I get to the top, one of my shoes falls. One of my shoes, it falls. So I'm at the top, but I can't go down because I don't have any shoes. I've got to stay at the top. And I've had this once a month at least. Different mountains, but always the same shoe problem. Give it up for the brilliant Jack Sweeney! And now, a final round of applause for the last poet of this half. Give it up for Conrad Byrne! She's never read here before. Please welcome to the stage, Connor. My mouth is drier as I stand and say, well, actually, I have read here before. And I start to read. I can't move my feet. And for this one, I normally try to breathe. And I know my mouth's moving because no one said anything. But I can see the back of my head bob before me in front of a room where they all stare up at me and hear only she, 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 she. I see how my hands are tiny on my wrists and how my jumper rests wrongly in places and how my jeans restrict my legs that are not from the men's section. My insides turn in treachery, peering like peeling back skin and cell walls left with a neon chromosomal scoreboard parading XXXXX X, 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 stuffed into loose boxes and a tight dust. All up my body, I can't let skin touch skin, and it's wrecking the tightrope, but I can't do a thing because I am not on that stage. She is, and she, she, she is a shell I shucked years ago, now dragged from disuse to take back my tongue, and that muscle has memory enough, but she, she, she is long gone. The years has not spoken, she only knew wrongness. I stop. They clap, I'm whittled down, stripped from a skull of the flesh that remains. See my teeth ticking, see my lungs, see a larynx that is only yet to break. Splinter these nerves, drain these vessels of blood, taint the soul and my bones that is keeping me up. I sit and I forgive that clumsy man. He's drunk. But if I forget, then who could say what next time I'd become? Give it up for the brilliant Conan Man! And that is the end of the first half of the 2017 Roundhouse Poetry Slam final! You guys all smashed it! Well done. Our judges are just finishing up their scores for this round. Uh, you're judged out of both writing and performance in the Roundhouse Poetry Slam uh, out of 10. Well done, guys. You all smashed it. Uh, and one of our judges we're going to hear from now, uh, she's going to deliver a poem for us. Bridget, are you ready? Great. Amazing. Uh, she's one of my favourite poets. She's one of the first people that I ever met at the Roundhouse when I joined the Poetry Collective. She published an incredible anthology last year called Titanic. Will you please give a massive round of applause for the brilliantly talented Bridget Menemore! <laughs> Jack, um, and thank you all. It's a real honor and a privilege to be here. This is the first year I'm officially too old for the slam, um, but the sting has been taken away by coming back. Uh, it's grown. It, when we did it literally nine years ago, it was in the tiniest room in the roundhouse, and it's so lovely that so many people care about slam poetry now. It's great. Um, yeah, so I, I came third, I should say, um, so didn't win. Um, but yeah, it's fine. I'm really good friends with the person who did win. The person who came second, I don't really know anymore. Uh, <laughs> will that recreate? I'm going to shut up. Um, so the poem I'm going to read is called Home. Um, it's a piece I was asked to do by this great collective called Galdem, which is for women of colour. And I got asked, ooh, clicks, clicks. They did a whole series of eight poets, quite a lot of them connected to the roundhouse. And they asked me to write about home. I wanted to write about Peckham and gentrification and being angry. And I ended up writing about my mother, which happens a lot. Um, make of that what you will. Home. 
Creeping through the belly of a city that reluctantly said yes. My mother walked home most mornings after a night shift at the job she pretended not to have. She would curl the lie around her mouth, spit it out, brush her teeth and say she was about to sleep before walking to Hoban from Peckham and cleaning offices for six to ten hours, then walking home and getting up in time on, for church in the morning in a 10.30 a.m. sermon, and she would still give her last tenner in her purse before payday on Tuesday to the collection box. Creeping through the belly of a city that reluctantly said yes, my mother walked home most mornings after a night shift at the job she pretended not to have. If she lied, it wasn't pride. No, it was shame or pride or shame we're not sure if she lied it wasn't shame no it was pride she was feeding her family conquering the beast allowing herself to be sucked on like a hard-boiled sweet and this city didn't spit her out she leapt through the gaps in its teeth she survived here you don't know pride until you see a Ghanaian woman who hasn't closed her eyes for longer than four two hours in four days this is the way we used to live not hand to mouth, but fingers curled into fists, fighting back against the things we were supposed to bow down to. And so creeping through the belly of a city that reluctantly said yes, my mother walked home in the dewy light of a southeast London morning after a long night shift at the job I say she pretended not to have. I don't remember the specifics. Maybe she didn't lie. Maybe I'm embellishing our lives to romanticize the plight of the working class because I know without romance and poetry in our poverty and with no emotion when describing our lack of money, you might not understand that you are supposed to feel angry. But my mother still walked home in the dewy light of a southeast London morning after long night shifts at the second job she was proud to have. The job she would boast about because this was the thing that was keeping us alive in a country that colonized our own in the part of the city on the wrong side of the river. This city was the place she was surviving in. This city would be the place her daughter would call home. One day, we'll be accepted here, she'd say. One day, this place will be yours as much as anyone else's. One day, I realize I know every street in SE22, SE15, and SE5, and I have no idea how to get lost in my corner of the city. One day, I realize this corner of the city is mine. One day, a man walking in the opposite direction to my mother crosses the road, calls her a black bitch, and tells her to go back home. She tells him, I would if my daughter wasn't quite so British. I applied for dual citizenship as a teenager, and they turned me down the second time, and the first. Sorry, you're not Ghanaian enough. You haven't lived here for more than two months. Actually, have you even visited more than once? You children of parents who work two jobs in countries that colonized ours. You're too British. You're too English. Too London. You might eat our food, but you can't cook it. You might, wear, <laughs> you might wear our clothes, but only after the white girls wearing kente made it fashionable. Your voices might range from hood to clip. You might know how to code switch from good white answering for police voice to chatting Bear Breeze to your mate's voice, but you can't speak our language, even if you do understand the words. Your city reluctantly said yes to your parents, but you say no to us. It is too late to belong here, babes. You don't have a home here babe so go back to London go back to England they might not want you but go back to England go back to Britain go back home go back go back go back go thanks give it up for the brilliant Bridget Minimore please check out her writing online she's an incredible poet and journalist and writer uh, that is the end of the first half of the slam. We are now going to take a 15 to 20 minute interval so we can count up all of the scores. But can you please give up another time for one of our brilliant 11 poets <laughs> and our wonderful judges and Bridget. And we will see you in 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm now going to bring on a wonderful DJ called Nikki Logan. And we will see you in 20. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jack Brooke, and I'll be hosting now the second half of the Roundhouse Poetry Slam Final 2017. Yes. Well, hey, I've got my hosting partner with me. Can everybody give it up for the wonderful Jackie? Who is interpreting the whole thing. We are on Facebook Live. Ooh, mysterious. Wave at camera, wave at camera. Uh, please, if you haven't uh, liked the Roundhouse Facebook page, do so. You can watch it back. It'll also be on the Roundhouse YouTube channel. It's one of all of our wonderful poets' individual poems. Give it up for our poets for this evening. 
There are 11 of them, all of them aged 16 to 25. They've gone through, the, some of them have gone through the Young People's Program here. The Young People's Program at the Roundhouse, I would also recommend you'll check out if you haven't. There are opportunities there from kids like from 11 to 25. Like it's amazing the amount of sort of broad range of young people that come through the doors. Uh, has everybody voted? Say yes if you have. Well done, because it's too late now. Well done for exercising your democratic right. Uh, perfect. I'm not going to do much more now. We are going to hear from one of our, judge, uh, one of our judges. Uh, he was the Roundhouse Poetry Slam winner in 2015. Uh, and we're so chuffed to have him. He's bloody brilliant. Can you please have a massive round of applause for the wonderful Caleb Femi? Hello. Hi, guys. Um, right, uh, it's, it's a real privilege to be here and also to hear some fantastic um, poetry today. I don't know why I'm talking like I'm a shy person. Right, so um, <laughs> it's quite uh, poetic that um, the slam, uh, the Roundhouse Poetry Slam, is on an, an election night. Um, I think for, for most South Londoners, like if you've been living in South for at least 15 years, then you kind of know that we kind of have our own prime ministers anyway. Um, probably the most famous one being Del Boy Trotter. Yes, I can hear some South Londoners concurring. Um, and at the moment, I would say that arguably the prime minister for South London at the moment is a artist, a musician called uh, Giggs. Um, Yes, so this poem is in praise and in defense of gigs. Everyone knows a South London boy when they see one. Although no one can say exactly how they know, they just know. Something about his walk, how the ground squirms in fear, in sympathy. Catch him in a shrubs, not dancing, leaned up on a wall, trying to resemble a wallflower, looking more like poison ivy, more like lynching rope hanging from the ceiling. If ever he is present in such a party, know that it would get locked off before midnight and it will be by his doing. Look at him, godless, satanless, a black orb unclaimed in a grand scheme of what should make sense. What is it? about the southern solar wind that makes a boy from solid light and a night tracksuit. Who will sing the song of this sad boy from the south, if not one of his own? Man like Giggs, the best thing to come out of Peckham since Del Boy Trotter. Before you, boys from the Nam were known for riding out, locking off shrubs, and generally handing out bad days to whoever wanted it. And then you dropped Hollow Meets Blade and the glow of your music shrouded us in the dankest dank wherever we went. And even the Northwest girls who are usually so stush, you would have to take a good look at your skin to make sure that you weren't invisible. They saw our potential for the first time. Certain men pushed their luck. They lied and said they were your cousin. Certain men were just grateful to be seen. This is what we owe to you, Giggs, the Peckham ambassador, the Prime Minister of South London, the only voice to unite Peckham, Brixton, and Lewisham. We'll never know how many lives you've saved on those peak nights when a boy holds years of his life in the dark lines of his palms, on the verge of scribbling his existence into a headline, thinking no one knows his pain until he hears the intro to Pain is the Essence a song that cried on behalf of boys too dehydrated from the heat of the streets to shed a tear for themselves. Your music is literally community therapy for those boys. And in return, boy them put a ban on your name. 14 years and counting. My boys and I have been listening to your music 14 years. Imagine that, your voice more consistent, more present than some of our own fathers. Thank you. Give it up for the brilliant Caleb Fermi. Please continue to check his stuff out online. And if you've never seen gigs before, he's performing next week at the Royal Festival Hall, which is like 
such a great place for gigs to be. It's cool. Uh, so, we are going to now continue with the second half of the Poetry Slam. Uh, and I'm going to go back to my hype girl, Louisa. How you doing? Did you have a little drink? Two! This girl knows what to do on a general election Poetry Slam night. Um, cool. So, right, Louisa, let's start that sort of polite Radio 4 poetry clap. Oh, my God, poetry. Lovely, 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 lovely. Now, Radio 2, slap in the knee. Radio 1, whoops and hollers. Pirate Radio, go mad. And welcome onto the stage, Suhaima Mansour Khan. Some poems force you to write them. The way sirens force their way through window panes in the night and you can't shut out the news, even when you try. Write a humanizing poem, my pen and paper goad me. Show them how wrong their preconceptions are. Be relatable. Write something upbeat for a change. Crack a smile. Tell them how you also cry at the end of Toy Story 3 and you're just as capable of bantering about the weather in the post office queue. Like everyone, you have no idea how to make the perfect amount of pasta, still. <laughs> Feed them stories of stoic humor. Make a reference to childhood. Tell an anecdote about being frugal, mention the X Factor. Be domestic, successful, add layers. Tell them you know brown boys who cry. About the sides of Assad's, Amir's, and Hassan's, they don't know the complex inner worlds of Samayas and Aisha's. Tell them comedies as well as tragedies. How full of life we are, how full of love. But no, I put my pen down. I will not let that poem force me to write it because it is not the poem I want to write. It is the poem I have been reduced to. Reduced to proving my life is human because it is relatable. Valuable because it is recognizable. But good GCSEs, family and childhood memories are not the only things that count as a life. Living is. So this will not be a Muslims are like us poem. I refuse to be respectable. Instead, love us when we're lazy. Love us when we're poor. Love us in our back-to-backs council estates, depressed, unwashed, and weeping. Love us high as kites, unemployed, joyriding, time-wasting, failing at school. Love us filthy, without the right color passports, without the right sounding English. Love us silent, unapologizing, shopping in Poundland, skiving off school, unsure, homeless, sometimes violent. Love us when we aren't athletes, when we don't bake cakes, when we don't offer our homes or free taxi rides after the event, when we're wretched, suicidal, naked, and contributing nothing. Love us then, because if you need me to prove my humanity, I'm not the one that's not human. My mother, my mother texts me too after BBC News alerts. Are you safe? Let me know you're home okay. And she means safe from the incident, yes, but also from the after effects. So sometimes I wonder, which days of the week might I count as liberal and which moments of forehead to the ground am I conservative? I wonder, when you buy bombs, is there a clear difference between the deadly ones that kill and the heroic ones which scatter democracy? I wonder, is it not guilty until proven innocent? How can we kill in the name of saving lives? How can we illegally detain in the name of maintaining the law? I can't write it. I put my pen away. I can't, I won't write it. Is this radical? Am I radical? Because there is nowhere else left to exist now. to Sahima Manzor Khan. And now, welcome to the stage, the brilliant Rachel Nwokoro. I am a different woman to you. Wanyi, in the Igbo language of Nigeria, pa, 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 means woman. Oboronambo nwanegi wanye means if you are my sisters. Listen, ask, act. Oboronambo nwanegi wanye, please act like it. Abumwanye, I am woman, I am a black woman. I am a queer, black, second generation immigrant woman with a low income and persistent mental health issues who has been raped more than once. This can't be about being comfortable 
anymore. And for the love of God, it cannot be about attributing blame or feeling guilt. There's no space for it. At the moment, I write like I fight for my life because it's what I do on the daily. So fuck safe spaces. Spaces that we fill with shame that morphs into stardust, collecting in the dark matter of our eyes. Swallowed by black holes of our own creation, making it fantastical to see people fighting on wards, hidden in the shadows of their skin, weeping for their lives. It ain't enough. One day, one month, a year isn't enough. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me angry. I have reasons to be this fucking angry. Hear me on my terms and not yours. Accept the reasons I cannot always smile and while pursuing waves of empathy, find my eyes in that deep sea beckoning that it is far better to resurface and say, you don't know. Listen, ask, act. Act like it. Because sisters aren't pretty pussies and holding hands. Sisters are when you bleed, I bleed. Because if nothing else, our blood is the same. Please don't march with me, hands clapping together. Tell them to call us wolves that have been whistled at for the last time. I know you're fighting, but our battles are different. There are days I have hated white people. There are days that I have hated everyone because I have grown up with the inability to see any goodness within me unless it is a strength linked to slavery. I can't always be hopeful. <laughs> I shouldn't have to be. And I need you to hear that too. Listen, ask. I like it. Good up for Rachel Melkoro. And now please welcome to the stage Sarah McCrady. chapstick lips who will hold your hair back when you're neck deep in toilet porcelain and who will form boundless bonds and who will fight for their right to exist as humans even though they know they know they are gods girl gangs with braces decide the end of the world on the backs of buses whilst calling each other Babe, hot and yellow summer evenings. Girls hang out of third story windows, dropping obscenities below that somehow sound like the sweetest sonnets. Girls balance universes in each palm with a confidence that comes with self-made confidence. And if girls aren't good, then why did Billie Holiday sound like that? <laughs> girls are good, so they can grow humans inside of them. Lights off, she's at home, slow dance swaying with her baby wailing in her arms, doing it alone, because girls are gods. Girls are gods with zits and tits, and if girls aren't gods, then why didn't her brain explode when she was catcalled for the third time that day? Girls are gods with perfect patients who bleed profusely on a monthly basis and don't ask for sick days. Girls trailblaze, set fire to the male gaze. And burn the instructions to tell them how to fix things, nix things, or how to's, or don't do's, or how to be's, based on something someone else wants to see. And don't tell them to smile, because their smiles will break you. Ain't you know girls are born golden. Nothing more ethereal than soft back of the neck curls tangled in the gold chain of a necklace. Ain't nothing more powerful than two girls holding hands. Girls in parka coats in Canada. 
Girls in crop tops in Jamaica. Girls in crop tops in Glasgow in November. <laughs> Girls are good. Pouting in pastel on pedestals we built for each other. From the womb to the tomb, we are God. Give it up for Sarah McCready. And now welcome to the mic, Jet Sweeney. Art, God, and love walk into a bar. God says art is full of acid, deceit, and compromised vision of self. God says love looks like fear. Art says love looks different but feels the same. If a staircase is a biased corridor, coming of age has nothing to do with ascension. If love becomes a stranger, we lose everything. Art is always strange. You can't build a home in a person, it's not fair. You can't build a person out of doors, it's not square. That's why Dolly Parton is so important. Even backwards Barbies get their feelings hurt. If art plays God on stages and opens doors like love, when there is no more music, the sun switches off. And if the audience is saying, a fire burns the sacred, a fire burns their noses off, love me back, love me back, love me back, then mercy can't be gold, but it might be yellow. Innocence is hinted at, but looks more like a meadow. A gesture, years apart, same head, same arm, look at this thing that has happened, look at this thing that has happened. We like you like we like to touch. We touch you like it's not enough. It's not enough to like to touch. To touch is like a door. A door is like a skin, say, an open door, a wound, or graze. A graze is like a mark of love. Your knees will save your heart. But if your knees are full of grit, and if doors are no more door than brick, the skin is hard, the skin is thick, the skin is dull with age. You can't build a home in a person. You can't build a person out of doors. You, you can't put a door in a sentence, and you can't build a sentence without laws. Fear storms into the bar and starts beating love over and over. You don't have to be kind to anyone. You need to care less. You can go for a walk and find it boring. There is no test. I'm no more in love than next door is. I'm no more next door than my love is. I'm no more a door than a heart is. I'm no more a heart than an artist. Touching to be touched, yes, but still touching. Love me back, 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 love me back. When fear leaves, art says love looks like fear. God agrees. Give it up for Jack Sweeney. And now, welcome to the microphone, Tyrone Lewis. This one's about me and my mum. She taught me sarcasm before she taught me how to walk. Made sure I knew I was a Tottenham fan before I knew my time's table. She showed me Star Wars before she showed me how to dress. And my mother has a TARDIS heart. It may not look like much on the outside, but best believe me, it's bigger on the inside. And I have been lost down its hallways for all the space and time and keep finding new doors to explore. And I am sorry, Falcor, but her love is more never ending than your story. It's more unbreakable than your movie, M. Night. And it's serving more realness than any look I've seen on the main stage of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> you could be fooled into thinking that my mother's heart has never been broken. I know it skipped a couple of beats in high schools, but I think all those crushes did was soften it. I know it's still got a lot of room for Idris and Denzel <laughs> and a bit of Will and all of Adrian Lester, but I'm not sure if my father was the first one she let into it. Maybe he helped her fix it, kept holding it in place until the divorce, but 
I'm sure there must have been a couple of cracks after that, but I've never seen any fragments strewn across our living room floor. There have never been any splinters that have fallen into my dinners. If there were any shards missing, she's kept them well hidden. I guess my mum's a magician. She kept me thinking she was 27 up until I was 11. She kept appearing and reappearing at all my football matches, all my poetry nights. She keeps pulling my happiness out of her top hat. Scratch that. My mum is a superhero. She's carrying all my fuck-ups in one hand whilst breaking every obstacle in front of her with the other. She doesn't wear any spandex, but Kevin Feige is currently working on producing her own Marvel standalone film. Scratch that. My mum is a wrestler, and she is currently on the longest undefeated streak in WWE history, surpassing Oscar and Goldberg. Scratch that. My mum would beat your mum. Scratch that. My mum would beat your dad. Scratch that. My mum's a scratch that. My mum's a scratch that. Record scratch. My mum has a TARDIS heart. It may not look like much on the outside, but best believe me, it is more than the love that she receives. And I'm trying to make up for it, but I'm too busy being shit. <laughs> I keep swimming in Stella rather than coming home. I keep messing up my life knowing that she'll always be there to clean up after me. I keep trying to buy smiles, ignoring the ones that she gives me for free. And right now I have never connected more with Elton John and Blue <laughs> because there is a word that I'm trying to say to her, but I'm finding it so hard right now. So instead, here's a poem. This one's for me and my mum. Give it up for Tyrone Lewis. And now, welcome to the stage, Tambe Mavula. You are an enigma. A mountain summit with your head in the clouds, the twilight of a cold and foggy winter. Unrecognizable and inconceivable, you entered my life. Shaking, half asleep questions into waking, preluding answers which life's river may one day bring us to discover. Should the waters flow towards that ocean, you are black, unclear, and confounding. This journey has felt solitary for you when never felt never sensed, never seen or heard. Your hands failed to grip my pre-adolescent wrist, never quite felt the paternal loving touch I so long missed. Father, my tongue cannot muster many questions for you, for I am now grown, and I have grown content with the mystery of you. I pen down these lines, restraining back unsettled tears from eyes which look nothing like yours. The clarity of melancholy infuses my soul as solemn chords are played into my ears. I cannot help but sing of how wonderfully strange this world is. Life never fails to amaze me. Father, thank you. For my heart still beats with passion and purpose. Funny how things can still work, even when their seemingly vital parts aren't functioning. A bird is still a bird, even when it cannot be elevated by its wings. The night is still night, even when the artificial light steals away the sensation of being in the dark, with nothing but the moonbeam and stars illuminating what's necessary to be seen. A daughter is still a daughter, even without a... Father, I like to write poems. Black, unclear, confounding poems. I'm obsessed with deciphering everything and seem to fall in love with guys with Rubik's Cube-like personalities. And for that, I guess I have you to thank. I like to write poems, unsure and unclear, for it is here. Here is where I find peace. Sitting at the edge of the chasm of life's peak where I try not to be right, but understand that I am human. Here is where I choose to undress my pride and risk it all to not hide what's confined inside the holy temple of my mind. Here is my Bethesda. I am weak, yet I am strong, for I have discovered sufficiency in the grace of the Trinity, where I no longer behold through rose-tinted lenses and life becomes an unfiltered photograph. I am analyzing closely what a piece of art it is, woven together 
by divine hands this tapestry of bruised beauty and I am simply here, simply thankful to be here. Thank you. Give it up for Tembe Mavula. And now please welcome to the microphone, Connor Byrne. I kissed a boy on Holy Saturday, and for that sin he got my soul. He took me to his bed that night. I said I had cold feet, so he just held me as we slept. In the morning I remembered I had not thought to bring a toothbrush. He walked me halfway to the bus stop, and I walked as if in resurrection. We were 17, and I took the wine he gave to me. With the hiss of flesh around candlewick, he took the flame from his fingertips and pressed it onto me. As if I'd been made of clay and watching myself crumble, I found a man and made myself in his hands, but he sculpted me too much in his image, adorned in gold, dressed in cold civility, cased in ceramic, filled up with direst cruelty. Tongue turned well spoken well quickly, for he saw me as putty and elastic. What indents did not fade, what scarf or sleeve transparent. With his touches more and more goldly flaked from his knuckles to be replated in the morning in apology. Gold teeth fell all out of his mouth to lodge into my skin where it should not bleed. He had a way of twisting things. My hand in his became my hand in his grip, bent back till I was shuddering one night. He'd had too much to drink. I said, Boy, I need my hands to live, and boy, I bleed from my fingertips to touch him, to breathe him. I've seen that boy take life, and he has taken mine, and I stand still just out of the light of the street light, where I could see the stars. I wait for his claws to pull out of me, for him to spit back down my eyeballs that he took from their sockets of such ferocity. I tell myself that I will not miss him, but what would I be if I did not miss him, did not flinch when every blonde and whistler was he, did not miss mystery bruises in bathroom mirror steam, did not cut my gums of scalpel blades tucked still behind my teeth. I held a boy last night and ran my fingers through his hair. We went to sleep in separate beds, with separate knives under separate heads. Give it up for Connor Byrne. And now, welcome to the stage, Eni Okoronko. We knit these streets with pins and needles shook from hands and feet and heads thought simple and thoughts taught idle with the people that took your prayers but burnt your bibles wouldn't understand couldn't lift a hand to cross ourselves boredom's disciples i'm a failure despite you no i'm a failure to spite you we don't know why you hate us but we know that you're right to i do I do get caught by this crippling, contemplating, suffering, suffocating visions of tomorrow brought upon by yesterday's undermixed and overmeasured medicine. You all take it by the spoonful, it just saps at our innocence, chips at our vast armor of karma and vigilance, and weighs on my light a more malleable sense of worth that thought it a good idea to write these words to share these words in the first place making me face demons i drew with the last drops of ink from a biro i borrowed from you in the first place and they all have my face which is the face of the mandem face of the criminal if you can catch him No love for police, so we better dispatch them. They say all our worth is worthless. And there was a time that I thought I deserved this. Now pain only propels my purpose. You can spit on my grip, but it adds to my purchase. Do we want the world? Nah, but we earned it. For now we spit blood because we know our tongues turned it. Thank you. 
Give it up for Enyi Okoronko. And now please welcome to the stage, Jasmine Gardosi. Raise your hand if you sometimes feel uncomfortable talking about sex. Yeah? I'm glad we got that out of the way. If you carry that awkwardness around like a bad habit, drop it. Show me both your palms if you remember your first kiss. And you were awful. Yeah, weren't sure what to do with these, were you? If you've watched an explicit love scene with a parent and now you don't talk about it, show me your teeth. If you've ever got period blood on your clothes and it showed, curl your toes. If you've had more wet dreams than you care to reveal, scratch your nose nonchalantly as if you did that unconsciously too. If one Christmas you were basting the turkey when you realized this is the nakedest thing I've handled all year. <laughs> Blink. If someone has said to you in bed, I appreciate the gesture though, <laughs> hang your head. If you're single and you fucking despise Valentine's Day, cross your arms. If you have a partner and you fucking despise Valentine's Day, cross your arms. <laughs> then hug yourself. Hate and love can look the same sometimes. If you don't understand why people won't leave partners that hit them, well then that's easy. Take off your hand and give it to me. If you think homosexuality is an illusion, make me disappear. If you're still working out how to be happy on your own, Touch someone on the shoulder, even if that someone is yourself. If you know someone who was forced and they didn't know what to call it, breathe deep. If you've realized that transphobia is still accepted bigotry, sit up in your seat. If you've held a pregnancy test in your hand, clench it. If you've waited more than an hour at the sexual health clinic, bang your head a little bit. Nod it. If there is something that you have not told your family, and close your eyes if you worry sometimes about how we define masculinity. If you only learned what sexual consent was in your late teens, then grip your knees. And if you've ever felt pressured, then don't do anything for me. If there are things you wished you talked about more, look at your hand. If you can find a way to start the conversation, raise it. Give it up for Jasmine Gargosi. And now, welcome to the microphone, Leila Josephine. There is a blue in me. It comes sometimes. And when I look around, I see so much blue, all of us feeling alone all of the time, all of us closing ourselves in, not opening up or helping others, afraid it makes us weak. Muting, diluting our lives with countless obsessions and addictions to try and make things more bearable. Our parallels, our endless parallels are keeping us alike, but somehow still separate. Know that you can be broken and full and complete and a mess all at the same time and I see you. I see you as the blue of the sky which is sometimes not blue but orange, red and pink flames licking through the blue not taking no for an answer. In you I see the blue of the night sky which is so dark it is the blackness of every pupil of every eye. No, I see you as the blue of the sea which is not blue it is turquoise and purple and grey and it hits hard into itself ready to cast another new wave and yes I know. I am a poet talking about the sea. But please bear with me because I see you not as the shallows or the rock pools. You are all the ocean floor, dark like oil. What a curse to feel things so very deeply. But oh, what a fucking blessing too. We are all temporary and that is comforting to me. 
And when I die, give me back to that blue sea so I can go like my father and I can live again. But this time it is the Atlantic, which is a deeply green to me. And I can tumble to the landscape which lives inside my mother, repeatedly turning rock to sand, sand to water. But while I am here, I want to get close to it all. I need to start being a participant. Sometimes I go for months watching my life as if I was not in it. I want to engage in life. I want to sink my fingertips into it like it's a birthday cake. I want to dance naked in my room, admiring the ugliness of my body. I want to sing Robbie on karaoke and drink pints and try and dab with my pals. I want to talk to the strangers on the streets. What happened to our communities? What would hold us down now if we did not have gravity? We are always pointing out our differences, but I want to know what is the same about us. We are all made up of birth and death and blood and guts and wax in our ears of fears of loneliness and badness and feeling like we are on the outside looking in and skin and womb and shit coming out of our asses, which is disgusting, but kind of true. At least we have that in common. You are not alone, not with your breath that is proof that you are alive and still with us. Find your breath and know that it is your anchor in these weathers. That rain that whips across your face like an army of splinters. Know that the breath is the dust of your skin, the beat of your bones. Listen to the drums they play in your stomach. Close your eyes and hear them boom for you. Life is suffering, impossible, beautiful suffering. When you are sad, go outside. Do not reach for the screen or the bottle. Reach for a book or a friend or in between your legs or a tap to run a bath, reach for the laugh that sits in your collarbone. It is there to cure you of your sickness and of your sadness. Call upon it. You are a pure and wonderful thing. It's okay not to know the answers. The gray areas are often the most clear. Let's get rid of absolutes and rights and wrongs and goods and devils. We are not separate, so stop drawing lines. We all have a great river of resource that pumps through our spine like ice and heat. You have all that you need inside of you. Welcome that blue into your bed. Let it curl at your feet and rest. Throw off your duvets and move into your communities. They want you to feel alone and helpless, but you are not. I am not. I have barely slept, but I feel present, alive, and for the first time in a long time. So sure there is plenty worth living for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give it up for Leila Josephine. And now our final poet of the 2017 Roundhouse Poetry Slam final. Can I have a massive round of applause for the wonderful Ify Grillo. Nobody knows the troubles I've no, no, no. I sit down and I rank each day out of ten. Anxiety feasts on my heart when it's higher than six, punishing me for telling a joke, for smiling with purpose, for laughing and meaning it. But when it's below three, my anxiety treats me well. It curls up to me. It wants to Netflix and chill. It shrinks me so it can be the big spoon, which is to say my anxiety loves to take control to make love to me, to put its tongue down my throat so I don't panic. Anxiety wrapped around my lungs and heart like mucus. It talks to me all night so I never sleep. At 13, I learned that education will ignore the sufferings of people like me. That they'll talk about broken bones in biology, but they'll never address broken souls. That if I talked about the voices in my head, they call me crazy, which is to say I learned that some words only belong in poems. When I was 15, I closed my eyes and I saw no light. I only heard sirens whispering. And they told me to come closer, to come to the other side. And you know, they sounded like God, like the voice in my head which doesn't let me smile, like the voice in my head which told me laughter is a sin, that no one could ever love me, that on the other side I'd be able to sleep. So when I jump, you ask what went wrong, not knowing I'd been fading for some time now that this was never a one-time event. And you'll try and work out how I was feeling. Because what makes a smart boy with a future be so selfish? That this wasn't my decision, that my deed caused trauma. Why couldn't I have just calmed down and suffered for their sakes? You know, there were things I could have done. I could have read a book. I could have gone on a jog. I could have downloaded a puzzle app. I could have done Pilates. I could have done yoga. You know, just anything to think those happy thoughts, to do those happy things. 
why didn't I just breathe? But how do you breathe when even the plants don't want your oxygen? When your screams are eaten by the air? When you've made skeleton out of your own smile? Because I've always hung myself on hope, made a nylon noose out of promises of future happiness, but I'm so tired. I'm so tired, and you know I'm tired of feeling so goddamn tired because as a bird, I'm not just caged, I don't even have the strength to fly and you all here listen, and you act like you get it, but you don't and I don't want your self-help books because you don't know me you don't understand what I've been through, you don't know what I've seen and you'll try and you'll say you get it, but you don't no one understands, they don't understand because nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows nobody knows the troubles I've seen but they all seem to have opinions on my sorrow. Because you know, you tell me I'm a coward, but this, this for me is bravery. It's uttering automations that you will jump. It's using your heart as a launch pad. It's trying to breathe deep, even though the world is crushing you down. And as you know, it's trying to smile. It's trying to write a poem and not always be crying. But you know, being brave is shouting affirmations that you will jump. It's using your heart as a launch pad. It's breathing deep so you can finally be at 10 and fall. Give it up for the brilliant Effie Grillo. That concludes the poems for the Roundhouse Poetry Slam Final 2017. Give it up for our poets! Well done, everybody. You can uh, just have a round of applause. That was a phenomenal slam final as they go. Uh, and also, give it up for the wonderful Jackie Beckford! So, oh God, that one is louder than my one. Well, my one's probably as loud and I'm shouting, and if so, I'm very sorry for the last hour and a half. Um, so, I, I'm gonna do a poem now before we hear from Sabrina, our judge. That what's gonna happen now, the judges are gonna sort of finish off their scoring, the producers are gonna take them, the votes will be counted, and then in about 10, 12 minutes time, we'll have our winner. Does that sound good? <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, so my name is Jack. I started at the Roundhouse when I was 16 uh, and I kind of want to speak a little bit about this place because I think for especially the judges and I think a lot of the young poets as well, it holds such a sort of special place in not only sort of the community of London but also just like the fact that this slam has had <laughs> poets from outside of the UK even coming and supporting it which is amazing and I really wanted to sort of speak about this place and I don't think I would have really done any of the things that I've done without having had the support from the Roundhouse. And I wrote a show here, a sort of comedy theatre show, and I've, that then led to me making this sort of um, documentary. And the poem that I want to read inspired the documentary. Uh, it came out on BBC Three a couple of months ago called Happy Man. And um, I think the reason I want to read this is because whatever happens tonight, not only just the slam, but whatever happens in this election, whatever the outcome, I think the more people that support places like the Roundhouse that genuinely do care about young people and care about the arts and more importantly, care about the importance of community and having a space for people to come and have fun and be resilient and also hear such an amazing display of voices and stories. I think that needs to carry on whatever the outcome and yeah, give up the Roundhouse. Thank you so much for putting this on for nine years. Um, this poem, uh, yeah, is called Your Worst Success. I remember, wait, dear Ollie, I remember you were stressing out writing an article on our journalism course and you were really struggling with it. It was something to do with climate change. Quite frankly, I really didn't care. And I just, and I said, you can't just expect to be the best You've got to fail at it a few times before succeeding, and you did. You failed so many times. I'm not sure how. I don't need to know how. But you'd failed at it, and you were still with us. You were still suppressing all that dark matter, the damp that made your hands clamp up, so much so you were unable to drink your red stripe. We'd go to every pub in Kilburn, 
And it wouldn't be until that time we went to get cash out at the ATM by Bronsbury Station, some of you might know it, that I'd nervously finally tell you after months of waiting that, Ollie, I fancy men. And you said, Jack, you're like my brother. Why would I give a shit? Get 20 quid out or ask it's more expensive after midnight. <laughs> and then we'd dance. And you'd tell me how you used to write poems about ex-girlfriends and how if they'd steal your chips, that's when you knew she wasn't the one. <laughs> you said, if anyone ever takes the piss out of me, you'd <clears throat> the shit out of them. And whilst I didn't agree with your method of protection, it kind of felt nice. It certainly felt like, Jack, you're my brother. Like a brother, you were difficult, and I'm sorry I thought for a while you were too difficult because you weren't. You could never be, not then, not now, not ever. We didn't speak for a while, and our last phone call on February the 23rd was full of plans that only now I understand you never really made them. You let me dream them, book the tickets in my brain, wipe my diary for pretend, waste money sorting trains you knew. Or at least I hope you didn't. I hope that phone call would never happen, but it wasn't a surprise. I had heard it in my head before, but I hoped with all my heart that I'd see you married with a shitty digital marketing job, some annoying doppelganger kids in an awful car like a Kia Picanto or any Skoda. <laughs> and me as the token gay uncle friend person. <laughs> and if I'm honest, I'm a bit pissed off You've taken that from both of us. I'm angry at you for failing so many times, yet finally succeeding. I'm pissed off that you got yours, but you took away all of our sleep. And I'm angry that I had to go all the way to Bognor Regis for your funeral. You know I get bad travel sickness, and no offense, but Bognor Regis is a bit of a shithole. <laughs> I'm pissed off at you for thinking nobody cared when there were hundreds of people at your funeral that adored you, and I kind of find it funny that you're in the 27 Club, because it's the sort of cliche that you'd bitch about on Twitter, and that's all your fault. Well, it's not your fault, none of it is your fault. And I get it. And I'm sad. The only time I've ever prayed was on March the 6th, when Claire told me you were gone. I prayed so much that you were hopefully, finally happy. I wish you were with me, but that article you wrote on climate change ended up being pretty great, and you really were one of the best. Thank you. So yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. And, and that is um, inspired by this series I've made that all the things that I've done would never have happened without the Roundhouse sort of finding me at 16 and being like, you with the weird haircut, come on, I'm here. Um, I'm now going to present one of the judges who's going to come and read. She's a phenomenal writer, um, has just done so much stuff. I'm not going to say too much, but can you please have a massive round of applause for the brilliantly talented Sabrina Mafuz. I don't know if they planned this or not, but um, we're all from South London over there. Well, uh, not Jack. I'm from Watford. Oh, he's from Watford. No. <laughs> <laughs> he said it with a smile, like it might be South. <laughs> no. Um, and like the other two judges, and again, this is totally unplanned, I'm going to read some poems um, based in South London, inspired by South London residents. Um, these poems are all about women who work in different aspects of the sex industry. Um, this particular character is from, um, is working in street-based street sex work in, um, well, I won't be specific, but the South London area. Right, um, and uh, there's four characters in this. She's the oldest one. She's in her 60s. She's called Sylvia. Taking vouchers. Thing is though, we take cash. I mean, it's always been that way. You know how people say it's always been that way? Well, what they mean is, it has always been that way. 
Stars studding the sodding sky, that's how it's always been. The KFC geezer having some creepy old beard, that's how it's always been. Women getting money for men to do what they need to do so we can do what we need to do, how it's always been. You come along with a voucher card telling me there's 20 quid on that for Argos. Start listing all the things I can get from Argos, like I don't know what you can get from Argos, is not how it's always been. You must think you're onto something brand spanking new here. You must think you're showing proactive innovation. But, mate, let me tell you, what's always been will be. Those stars don't start shining on sludgy seabeds just so you can swim through the night, do they? In fact, you know what? By offering me these vouchers, what you're basically saying is that my service, this highly skilled, let me add, service, is not as important to you as another life basic, like electric. Because I know you're not going to ask the man in the shop to swap lecky credits for that stupid football trophy you've got stuck to your dashboard with super glue now, are ya? But if I asked, what would you rather go without tonight? Me or a bit of glow in your hallway? I know you'd want to get my talents and hold a candle when you get home, so you know, priorities, mate. You have got to prioritise in life, otherwise you just end up in the dark regardless. Talking of which, I do need a new lamp for the living room, so go on then, just this once. <laughs> um, thanks. And I'm doing two poems because they're still counting up the scores because it was... I mean, it's amazing that we got them ready in time, to be honest, because it was so, so difficult to do that. It's really... It doesn't look like a hard job because we're just sitting there watching um, great poems, but it's actually really horrible to have to put numbers on things. Um, but anyway, they, oh, this one, nice segue, this one has got numbers. Um, and again, it is Sylvia, and she's talking about the forces working against us. One, foreigns. Liberal I am. I mean, my mum was foreign, but even I have limits. You have to admit it's getting limitless, the shit we're expected to take, because others take shit, because their lives have had limitless amounts of shit. So now they get what they can, where they can. Do you think they know things we don't know? Two, images. How you might know me comes to mind every time someone says, I think I know you, I think you bloody well don't, but do you? TV, magazines, films, documentaries, mockumentaries all show me a version of me that isn't me. I'm not in the extreme me, just me. Pictures like that make it seem like we're greedy bitches wanting Gucci or paddling pools full of cocaine, even though I wouldn't say no to that, who would? I make my grandkids lunch for school every day. Three, porn. Cos I'm old, I get young ones haven't got a clue. Think they have a clue, but a clue would be to know where to look. They can't look unless it's on a screen. Like it myself sometimes, but it's not what I base my sexuality on. My sexuality is based on other people's, yes. I suppose that's true even now at this big age. But I'd rather that, at least the real people, even if I don't know the names. Other day, one said, I hope you don't have my baby. I said, love, I'm 62. He said, so. I said, you wore a condom. He said, so. I said, you only put it in my mouth. He said, so. <laughs> Four, police. Safekeeping is not keeping us safe. To keep us safe would be to keep us paid well, but women's jobs don't pay well, some don't pay at all. Squat it up all night long, you can't stop what can't be stopped. If you want us to stop, there's a way to stop making women's jobs that don't pay well and some which don't pay at all. I'm not a victim of anything but your system, the one you patrol, the one you plod, keep going. I'm not a criminal, he's not a criminal, move on. There's a woman over there who'll never get justice, get out of my business, get over there, stop business, being without justice. How about that? Are we ready? Yeah, we're ready, thank you. Give it up for the brilliant Sabrina McFlurs. Uh, Sabrina has done some incredible shows, and one of them is actually on here tomorrow night. Have we got any UK Garage fans in? <laughs> Hell yeah! With a little bit of luck, it's on tomorrow night. There are some tickets left, so please come. It's going to be like a party. It's like a, a really brilliant theatrical musical experience. Uh, and I'm now... Oh, actually, can we just say a massive thank you to all of our judges as well who performed? <laughs> Kayla, Bridget and Sabrina. I'm now going to welcome to the stage the man himself. Some of you may know him. He is the sort of like father of the roundhouse. Can you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Marcus Davy? You know, it's really weird being up here. I can't see any of you at all. Is there actually an audience there? Yeah. Could you see them? just me. Um, I don't usually wear a suit, for those who normally who know me, but I thought they're making the effort, so I'll make the effort. It's good to see that some of you did too. Well done. <laughs> um, first of all, big thanks to Jack. 
Thank you. And um, I bet most of you are out there sort of going, I know who I want to win. I can't make up my mind at all except for all of these guys I'd like to win. So thank you to the judges, because this is the hardest job you could possibly imagine doing to select who you'd want to win. I have nothing to do with who wins and who doesn't. So, um, but first of all, I want to say a few thank yous. This event would not be possible without the support of Colin and Helen David, who have supported this over years and have committed support over the next, I think, five years to make sure that this event is one of the key, key events of the Roundhouse year. So a big up for Colin and Helen David. Jack mentioned the work that we do here with 11 to 25 year olds. So those of you who haven't been here before, just below your feet is the Paul Hamlin Roundhouse Studios, which is 24 state-of-the-art studios, which makes us the biggest creative center for young people in the country. That, well, yeah, fantastic, isn't it? It's brilliant. Um, the creative industries are the fastest growing sector of the British economy right now and they have been for the last few years, and they can continue to do so if we keep investing in brilliant guys like those that are sitting behind me. If we keep investing in creativity, it will become known and championed as one of the bedrocks of our society. I don't think it is at the moment, but in other countries, people look at their creativity and think, actually, oh, we wish it could be as good as it is in Britain. So we need to keep investing in our creativity. For those of you who support our work, huge thanks, and particularly to the Arts Council of England for their long-term support of the Roundhouse from when we rebuilt to as we are today. So thank you to all of you. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix played on this stage. Pink Floyd gave their first ever major concert on this stage. Attila the Stockbroker performed on this stage. Nobody knows who he is. I do. Um, and in recent months, recent years, some of the greatest circus companies, theatre companies, musicians, spoken word artists have performed here. And one of our best events is with a group of young poets that actually the wider world has never heard of and it sells hundreds of tickets. So thank you for buying tickets to support these guys. The funny thing is, all those artists that I ma mentioned before were all the same age. They were all young when they played on this stage. And that's what this place is so good for. It's supporting those brilliant young artists as they emerge. Well, they've emerged, you know. Um, these guys are the voice not only of now, but of the future. In some ways, when I went to cast my vote this morning, before eight o'clock, I'd have preferred to have voted for these guys, wouldn't you? The proper voice of our society, the voices that actually care and mean something to all of us. And shouldn't we hear them more often? I think so too. So I'm really proud as the artistic director and chief executive of the Roundhouse that they are performing on the Roundhouse stage tonight. So thank you, thank you. And as I turned around then, I recognized their faces saying, just tell us who's won. <laughs> they don't want to hear about it anymore. So in um, third place, and I've got to say, I think the cups have shrunk this year. It, I don't know why, but they, from back there, they look tiny. And actually, up from up here, they look really small as well. So Jack, if I have the, the third place cup, um, I'm delighted to award the third place. Remember, I didn't vote and that's really important. I have nothing to the, the, I mean, I didn't have anything to do with the judging. These wonderful people did over here. But I agree with all the, all the, all the, uh, everything that's going to be coming up now. I'm the only person who knows as well. In third place, please congratulate Enyi.
know the technological world doesn't always help us. In previous years, we were in an analog world where we used to give people a check. Now we get their bank details and <laughs> send them some money. So in second place, I need to give that to you, Jack. Um, I got disqualified, just like saying. <laughs> um, Suhaima. And in every single competition you've ever seen anywhere in the world, some bloke like me that you've never heard of before gets up on stage and says, you're all winners. <laughs> it's true though, isn't it? They're all winners. <laughs> and I can still see them saying, just tell us who the winner is. Um, now, the winner gets 500 pounds. And this cup. And the winner is Jet. Thank you, and I'm handing over to Jack. Give it up for the brilliant Marcus Davey. Thank you, Marcus. Marcus really is the, like the dad of the roundhouse. And we have our three well, we have our one winner, our two runners up, and all of the brilliant poets. Can you please give it up for all 11 poets that you've seen tonight? Jasmine Gardosi, Kambe Mavula, Effie Grillo, Leila Josephine, Tyrone Lewis, Sarah McCready, Rachel Nwokoro, and Connor Byrne. And our brilliant third place poet, the wonderful Enyi Okorankwo. And our brilliant second place poet, Sahima Nanzor Khan. And our winner of the 2017 Roundhouse Poetry Slam goes to Jet Sweeney. Please make sure that you continue to check out all of these poets. If you go online to the Roundhouse YouTube channel, the poems will be uploaded. Share them, distribute them, invite friends. If you've got any mates that you think they're like, oh, what's spoken word? I don't know. Send it to them. Uh, can we please have a massive round of applause for our wonderful judges, Caleb Femi, Bridget Winnemore, and Sabrina Mafuz. And last but not least, the wonderful Jackie Beckford. Thank you, Jackie. I think me and Jackie are going to go off and find some other events that we can do as a sort of Jackie, Jackie and Jack duo. Um, but yeah, please continue to support the Roundhouse. Whatever happens tomorrow, community is at the heart of this place and I hope that spreads and we just get on with it, whatever happens. I have been Jack Rook. Have a wonderful rest of your last word festival. And give it up for all of our Roundhouse poets. Good night.